All right, welcome to 25 years of Linux in just five minutes. So I'm covering quite a few years pretty quickly, so I'll probably be talking faster than I'd like. Uh, if you have any comments or anything during the presentation, uh, my Twitter handle is at Linux questions, though more likely than anything else probably be corrections. Uh, brief intro for those of you not familiar with me. My name is Jeremy. I'm the founder of linuxquestions.org. I do a podcast called Bad Voltage with three other co-presenters, and as Ricky said, I am a community moderator at opensource.com. I also am on the board of the Linux Fund, so if you know any open source projects looking for funding, do feel free to track me down in the hallway. So if we're talking about the history of Linux, right, it starts with this guy, Linus Torvalds. And if you've been using Linux, has anyone been using Linux since the beginning? Oh, a couple, okay. So I've been using this since the beginning, or you just have been into the history of Linux, you probably are familiar with this post to use Nix, right? Just a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU. What you might not know is he originally thought Linux was too egotistical. He was gonna call it FreeX, which is a portmanteau of free, freak, and X. I think he made a good choice calling it Linux. So moving on to 1992, this is the first GPL release. And a lot of people don't know that Linux initially wasn't under a, a GPL license. It was under a custom license that had some commercial restrictions on it. And when you change it to the GPL, that's when you're starting to see your first distributions. And the next year, in fact, you get Slackware and Debian still going. Yggdrasil, which is what got me into Linux, was released that year. And that year, we also get 100 developers. So you're seeing the uptake of Linux pretty quickly right from the beginning. Now, in 94, you get the 1.0 release. And this is when Linus felt that all components of the kernel were kind of fully matured. But keep in mind, these are still early days, right? The only machines supported are single processor i386 computers. A year later, you get the 1.2 release, and that's through some outside contributions, you get uh, some additional architectures that are being supported. In 96, you get multiprocessor support, but more importantly, I think, we get this. And this really is the initial idea Linux had for Tux. Obviously, we ended up with this. Once again, I think, a better decision. Uh, 99, you get the 2.2 release. Uh, what you see that up there might not seem interesting now. At the time, it was some pretty heavy, pretty heady stuff. But you also got this, right? This is Alan Cox, for those of you not familiar. And while in the 2.0 series, a guy named Dave had been doing some late stage maintenance, and a Alan had been doing the A series series, this is the first time he passes mainline Linux off to another maintainer. All right, th in 2001, IBM pledges to spend a billion dollars on Linux just that year, and that was a huge year for the commercialization of Linux. That year, you also get the 2.4 release, which added a bunch of different technologies, and you get a new maintainer in Marcelo Tosati. Now, in 2002, something important happens. For the first time ever, Linux moves to source control management. Difficult to believe, but for a decade, he had done it manually through patches and email. 2003, you get the 2.6 release, but this is also the year that SCO group files sued against IBM, right? And that really added a lot of uncertainty into the Linux ecosystem. In 2004, and you're really starting to see the commercialization of Linux come upon, and with that, companies want cadence, right? They want to be able to schedule their products. They get that in 2004 with regular releases. Now, in 2005, due to some licensing issues with BitKeeper and a little bit of a fracas with Tridge, Linus writes Git and immediately moves all of kernel uh, development to that. And as you know, now Git is very, very popular. 2006, you get the first long-term support releases. They're still around today. Uh, that's Greg KH. He still does some of them as well. Now, in 2009, you kind of see a little bit of a symbolic moment in the commercial Linux landscape because the first time ever, the market cap of Red Hat equals the market cap of Sun, which is the largest uh, commercial Unix manufacturer. 2011, you get the 3.0 release, and there'd be 2.x had been going on for a while, right? And when someone asked Linux, why did you finally change from 2.x to 3? His answer was, the big change was nothing, absolutely nothing. In 2012, this is a, kind of another watershed moment for the commercialization of Linux. And for the first time, Linux server revenue sales equal that of the entire rest of the Unix market combined. I was a little surprised it was this late, to be honest. A little bit ironically, though, the i386 processor support, and now remember, the first release of Linux that was the only processor support, was completely removed. Now, last year, we had the 4.0 release. And once again, this was kind of a bit of an arbitrary version change. But it did bring some cool things like live patching to mainline which brings us to today, 2016, right? Hard to believe, but the final resolution of the SCO case just happened this year. It's astonishing that it took that long, but there it is. And over 13,000 developers from well over 1,000 companies have contributed to Linux, and that's just since the adoption of Git, which is really when we can get meaningful numbers. Uh, it's over 22 million lines of code, right? Over 
three, four, five billion dollars to, to redo it, which is impressive, but not quite as impressive as the fact that Linux really is everywhere. From this watch to the largest supercomputers in the world, it's everywhere. And that's 25 years of Linux in just five minutes. Yeah.